p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. It's time to start our show. Hello and welcome to HuddleCam HD Live today. We are talking about the Presence Summit, which is coming up in just seven days, one week. This is our channel partner webinar where we're getting together with our channel partners to discuss behind the scenes what this present summit is, what value it provides to our channel partners and end users. It's a full day of video communications professional development, but we're going to go behind the scenes to what makes this virtual event different and hopefully highly innovative so we can prepare your organization for a new kind of conversation, a new type of communication that hundreds of millions of people are taking seriously now because it's essential to their business. Joining me today, I have Bill Mullen, the CEO of Starin AV. How you doing, Bill? Thanks for joining me today. Wonderful. Good to be here. Applause for all of the uh, gathering here. Got some heavyweight folks. And the present summit, we're poised and ready to have an impactful event. Well, let's jump right into it. This is a virtual event. Virtual events are becoming so popular. So what we're going to do today is we're going to briefly introduce you to the present summit, why we decided to put this thing together, how we're going to do it differently than perhaps some of the other virtual events you may have seen. Then we're going to hand it right over to Tim Albright, Charmaine, and Mark from uh, from various parts, professional audiovisual integrators from around the globe and the United States to talk about the Pro AV Comeback Playbook for COVID-19. But first, Bill, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your thoughts on the present summit? You know, we're really living in a new existence. Most of us on this call, we've been in and around the video conferencing business for decades, practically. But that really connotates going down the hall to a meeting room, an island, and having a call to another meeting room, another island. And we've really transformed into a new video presence. It's everywhere. It's part of my life and probably yours day to day, minute by minute. I have people literally knocking on my office door saying, hey, Bill, I got a moment. We have quick video ad hoc calls. We have major strategy meetings. We have often tactical kind of tune-up meetings. And so this whole new environment that we're living in is an immersive video experience. And we realized creating what we were gonna have as a concentration day, we wanted to number one, have a learning track that caters to how can you make those meetings more meaningful. But the second part is we really wanted to have a track that helps us look at an experience driven mindset. How, how do you have design thinking towards building experiences? And whether those are experiences are events like the present summit, we want to show you how that works. It could also be just day to day, what kind of customer experience journey do your customers have? And how do you use video to effectively and appropriately intervene? Where are human intervention points within that experience so that um, you can become more engaged, more engaging? So that's the basic premise behind the summit. Uh, we have it as a professional development track. We also have it as a live stream track. So we're going to have some people who are viewing a little more passively, but we also wanted to have a high degree of engagement and really so that the attendees can become thought leaders themselves. It's not just to say, listen to us, we're experts, but it's also for them to go back and be catalysts in their organizations to spur new experience thinking. And so we resorted to probably the founder, inventor, and grandfather of the whole experience movement um, in Joe Pine, uh, you and I, Paul, were kicking around. How do we really create a, an engaging um, set of interactive experiences online? And how can we truly uh, inspire others to do the same? Um, and so that's what it's about. And we hooked up with Joe Pine himself. Paul, Paul just happened to make a reference to him in his new book. Paul, tell us that story. 
Well, yeah, but I, I referenced Joe Pine in my my book, The Virtual Ticket, um, which was has been very timely. And it, we, you guys, I'm happy to give this book away for free at ptzoptics.com slash book. And it's about hosting virtual events. And the experience economy really helps you understand the power of experiences on top of the products, the services, and the goods that many of us you know, sell to make a living. But adding that experience on top is really what creates relationships and the value add that many of us may be doing um, accidentally or you know, not really thinking about it. Maybe you're really great at sales and you're not realizing that it's the experience that you're delivering that's really what's working for you. And so breaking it down with this book was incredible. Now that we're living in this you know, online communication world, Bill and I recognize that hundreds of millions of people are using online communications, yet barely any of them, barely a pers- 1% of them have actually uh, done professional development to increase their effectiveness with online communication. So we saw a massive opportunity, but we also wanted to create a case study with Zoom on how to create the most powerful virtual event experience possible and give that playbook to everyone that is our partners and our dealers and really the world in general. So we we literally hired Joseph Pine. We said, Joe, we're going to need you for this. You wrote the book on this. And he helped us design what you're looking at right over here, which is a layer of educational presentations, right? Great content, great presenters. We're going to talk about a few of them. Getting to engage, whether it's the chat, whether it's a Zoom meeting, but really engaging and helping people participate, but then leveraging not just a one-way communication technology, which is live streaming, but two-way communications, which is a Zoom meeting, right? And then going further into breakout sessions, and then something that Joe Pine helped us really, I think, pioneer in many ways is a virtual world cafe experience that happens in small group breakout rooms inside of Zoom that rotate and we'll, we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit here. There's a whole behind the scenes guide um, on how we're going to do this. But Joe Pine, uh, I think at a high level, Bill, you wanted to share kind of what his thought process can mean for, the, for pro AV in general when we're rising above just commodities, goods, and services. This was the major paradigm shift for me when I read his book. And that is how you can have more meaningful relationships with those you serve. And this chart here is a a pyramid, as you see. And it's basically the different offers that we have in our business. And of course, as you go up the pyramid, the smaller it becomes, because the more specific it becomes, the more targeted and perhaps hopefully reaching a higher level result at the base of course is commodities and most of the time people are just saying what's my price i just need this and they they need cable they need something at a very base level we as an industry have been fairly um operative within the goods level and that means we're very feature benefit in our thinking and and the way we present our uh, offer. And, and at times it becomes transactional. But yet, I think within the last 15 or so years, um, we've tried to add services to that. We've always done things uh, to add value, wrapping around the near product sale in the way of installation, implementation, programming, even aftermarket services. Um, but yet, you know, that is only a first step towards truly being interacting with the client. And that experience level is where you've really taken it to living with the customer, that there is a more of a lifespan approach and perspective to things. How is the customer effectively using what we've put in? And how can we encourage and help them get the best return on that investment? So therefore, that's that's an encounter. And, and you're helping them on their journey as a sojourner and so it takes a little more time to get into the fabric of their organization and to be able to be just an influencer when you get to transformation that is really where you have highly impacted either their people's productivity or other aspects that they were out to achieve 
in terms of what AV Communications was going to do for them. I, so, I, I really agree completely, Bill. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities to use virtual events in that, in that space as well, especially right now as uh, you know, COVID-19 is not necessarily slowing down. A few of the panels that we'd like for you guys to, to look out for, one is the campus and the workplace reimagined, right? Reimagining the campus and, and workplace learning. And you know, higher education obviously is a big customer for many pro AV channel partners. And so we've put together a panel that includes Sean Brown, who's the chief strategist at Campus Reimagined, John C. Idleston, who's the professor emeritus at CSU Monterey Bay. We've put, uh, added Joseph Way, the director of learning environments at USC, and Julian Phillips, the SVP global workplace solutions provider at AVI SPL, to try to drill down on higher education is going to go through a massive shift in the fall, but not only in the fall, but in the next five years. And it's going to require a lot of professional audiovisual and technology to make this uh, transition possible from, you know, almost, tw- you know, barely anything has happened in higher education as far as, um, you know, transformation. So it's a big deal. And then another is the evolution of the home office and reshaping of the workplace. And actually, Tim Albright's here with us today. Tim from AV Nation is going to be helping to explain this. And then Tyler Buell, who is from Zoom, who recently published some of the offerings that Zoom is promoting to help, you know, offices and workplaces kind of reshape the way they think about technology, putting technology in between executives and their audiences. So, you know, so much change is happening. We think that tuning in for these events is going to be highly beneficial. Now, I wanted to take a moment to to take a high-level look at the present summit. There's a live stream track and a professional development track. Obviously, we invite our channel partners to be part of the professional development track. This has been put together, again, with Joseph Pine to try to understand how can we maximize our exposure on social media for the event, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook, but then provide small group collaboration experiences where there's two-way question and answer sessions where we can actually have Joseph Pine asking questions of you. How are you going to transform your business? And then give um, you know anyone who signs up for this the ability to ask Joe Pine and mingle and rub elbows with others in a way that you know could actually be more productive than a regular event, if you think about the amount of FaceTime and small group breakouts that we're going to be able to achieve, it's not going to completely replace an in-person event, but it could be, and I hope will be, not only a great learning experience, but just as productive, if not more productive, for those who really are proactive about getting everything that we can offer from these amazing speakers and uh, folks that we we can learn from. So we also have some live entertainment. We have G-Love, who's going to be performing at our finale. And then we have a live tour from New York City. Urbanist will be joining us live from New York. So what's a great event without some fun entertainment? And then I wanted to quickly give you just a short behind-the-scenes look at our studio, just really quick so that you guys can see a little bit about what what can go into this. This is possibly something that maybe your um, customers might want to put in at their studio. So we have PTZ cameras, we have live streaming technology, headset microphones, we've even got this cool little controller for Zoom. Um, But let let me show you really quickly a little look around our studio. Yeah. Ah, okay, cool. So this is a live view of our studio, just really quickly. This is the camera that you're seeing me on. And just really quickly thought I'd show you guys this. Here's Mike, our producer. So we do have a real person here still producing. There's Bill uh, waving over there. Um, This is our Zoom meeting. Okay, so we use Zoom to bring everybody in. And then this is our video production gear where we're, we're live streaming out to the cloud. We've got some LED lights, right, to make it look nice. Um, some PTZ optics cameras, some lights, and then I have a, a little uh, eye on YouTube and Facebook, a little television. But, you know, it's simple. We're still working on our, our podcasting studio over here because Chris Netto, I know, wants to do some podcasting. But 
this is, you know, what I think is a modern studio. And there's many different varieties and versions of, of what you can help your customers put in. But we're definitely demonstrating the power of what you can do here. Um, that's my social media there. I'll turn this off now. Um, of what folks can do with virtual events. So this is definitely something that we're excited about sharing. And with that, we're going to hand this over to Tim Albright and his guest, Charmaine and Mark. So guys, why don't you go ahead and jump in here? Thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, we're going we're gonna to hand it over to you guys. All right. Thanks, Paul, so much. Um, so so uh, first of all, uh, Charmaine uh, Torella from Ferex. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Welcome. And Mark Coxon awesome. from Tangram Interiors two separate coasts and I'm on the Yahoo in the middle. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Good. So <clears throat> let's start with this. Uh, kind of, Charmaine, we'll start with you on this. When, while we're in these different phases, and, and the one thing that that uh, us folks here in, in the U.S. get to experience are 50 different versions of what phasing means, uh, right? For 50 or 51, really, uh, the, the uh, um, yeah, D.C. So as we're all facing and, and, and in these different phases, what can integrators do right now, regardless of whether they're still in phase two or maybe they're moving on to phase four, what can integrators do right now, not only to prepare themselves, but also their companies and, and their, their employees? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of things they can do. I mean, the most important thing is, you know, everyone is wondering, okay, what kind of revenue we're going to make once we ramp up and get through the phases. But in order to prepare for that new revenue stream, you have to make sure your back office is set up for that. So monthly billing. Um, in the AV world, monthly billing is not really a huge thing. Not a lot of integrators are set up to do that. One of the things that customers are going to need is they're going to need a kind of service type model payment for AV, so AV as a service. So to make sure as a company that you're able to provide monthly billing to a customer, meaning they're able to pay you monthly for the services to be able to set your back office up in that manner. So that's a very key thing that's happening now because a lot of customers are reassessing their budgets. They're not gonna have that capital expenditure like they planned on having this year. So it's gonna to turn to OPEX more. And in order to help uh, facilitate their needs, you have to be able to give them a service where they can bill you know, that expense monthly. So that's one major thing that I'm seeing coming across. All right, Mark, she says monthly billing. That's something that we've ta been talking about in the AV industry for a number of years, recurring revenue. You know, is this, is this the, the time where we, we're not only you know, reassessing our back office procedures, but also kind of what we're what we're offering people. Yeah, I think I think have a, a unique opportunity right now, right? Because I think as an industry, we've known for a long time that if we are tying our futures to profit margins on black boxes, that eventually we're going to be in trouble, especially as things trend more towards IT, because IT services and products are typically well, IT products are typically single digit margins. So if we're trending towards that end of the industry and we're holding onto the box, um, it's hard. It's going to be hard to do that. But I think right now what we have is we have this unique opportunity is that many times our businesses are going so fast and furious as integration companies that we're trying to keep up with the next project, the next punch list, the next thing that's on our plate. And although we know we have these initiatives in the background, we really haven't been able to settle in and try to figure out how to get them off the ground. And I think right now as integrators, especially if you have a little downtime in a certain division in your company, this is the opportunity to look at your business and say, okay, if we were going to serve this clientele today, the way they want to buy and purchase things today, how do we do that? We actually have potentially the time to focus and to build that from scratch. Whereas in our fast and furious day to day, we don't necessarily have that. So I think this is really a time where integrators can look at the talent that they have. If there are people that aren't super busy based on the market that they usually serve, we can start to talent grid people out and say, okay, who is best in our organization to start to go and move these initiatives forward that we've wanted it for for a long time, but we just haven't been able to yet. Charmaine, re reassessing and, and building things from scratch is a scary thing to do, uh, especially when you've been doing it for a long time or you're, you're, a, uh, you're, a, you're kind of entrenched 
uh, in what you've been doing. So how do you do that? How do you take, whether it's your employees, right? And, and you reassess them and, and their skill set, right? Because as we all, all, as we all age, you know, I'm not the same person I was five years ago. Your lead tech is not, is not the same person. So reassessing your, your employees and where they best fit, but also, you know, your offerings, like Mark said. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. You have to first look at the market, right? One of the things, as Mark said before, we're all fast and furious, and that's not the movie we need to be uh, right now in our AV lives. We need to be more, you know, strategic, like Return of the Jedi and planning for the future, right? I love using movie analogies, so can't help I love it. the fact that you used Return of the Jedi, but go ahead. <laughs> One of my favorite one in the trilogy, actually. So basically, we have to look at the market and take a look at the customer, right? What are the customers doing? Where are they going? What are they implementing more? What do they need more? We know they're working from home more. We know they're going to need more solutions around assessing their network. We know they're going to need more solutions on virtualization, uh, digital transformation. Once we take a look at that, then the company has to look inside and say, okay, let me look at my people. Who has these skills? Oh, there's one guy that's CCNA uh, certified. There's this person that has this. And how we build upon that. So first you have to understand what the market is asking for and what it's going to call for. And then you have to take that and look inside and say to yourself, who has some of these traits that we can build upon? And then you start there. And then when you pick those people out and they become your subject matter experts, right? Um, we like that word. Um, developing that pool of subject matter experts that can develop more and build upon those uh, sectors that we know are starting to come into play and start training and implementing uh, certifications now. That's one thing. The other thing is AV companies also have to assess you know, where do they want to go? You know, don't do this as a temporary reactive thing. Because again, like you said, in AV, we react, we're fast and furious a lot. We need to be proactive and we need to get ahead of that. And we have to start planning. Do we want to commit to this? What is it going to take? And we have to make that assessment. And then last but not least, the way we're working now is very different from the way the AV world works. Traditionally, we are field people, meet in person, you know, basically go in the field, see things, meet people, have lunches. We, you know, are face to face most of the time. Now we're doing most of our meetings and discussions virtually. So we have to learn how to conduct and facilitate uh, those environments better. We have to ensue more of Zoom training, Teams training, also training your staff on how to un learn the engineering and operational staff on how that works because your customers are doing the same thing. And so you have to learn how to work that into your portfolio as well. And no, those are, those are just a couple of things to start. Right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's, a, it's a deeper discussion that has to be had. All right, Mark, we, we've talked about what folks can do now, right? So let's let's move from doing now and, and looking at those recurring revenues. We, let's reassess what we've got. Let's reassess our, our offerings. As we all move through these different phases coming, coming out of COVID-19, what is the next step, right? What is what is the next thing that we can do as as we, we let's say that we, 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 we buy into the idea of, of going uh, service-based or we buy into the idea of AV as a service or, you know, some sort of recurring revenue model? Then as we get closer and closer to being back at, you know, at, in the field, like Charmaine was saying, what is the next step for that? What, how, do we, how do we come out of this successfully? So I think there are a couple things here, and there are a couple key words that I want to emphasize that, I, you know, unfortunately, I don't think we've always, we've always um, emphasized as, as an AV industry. Um, you know, focus and planning are, are key. And many times we haven't we haven't really focused in on on what those opportunities are and how we plan to get there. Um, for me, looking at looking at the market going forward, um, you know, it'd be optimistic to say that everything's going to go back to exactly the way they were. And I think it's also an overreaction to say that nobody's ever going back to the office again, right? I mean, we hear both extremes of this, and we live in a world right now where people like to push us all the way to one side or all the way to the other, and we are going to be in the middle. I think some of the things Charmaine was talking about that are interesting is that these give us opportunities to maybe baby step into things. 
right? So we can, we can take the opportunity to start to explore some of these types of business in this downtime um, and then look at how that partitions out. Um, the other thing is, is as we get creative with our staffing and we're able to maybe give people uh, some agency to create something new within our companies, we build loyalty and proprietorship with our employees, right? We really are giving our employees a chance to shine and to drive an initiative forward, which may spawn a whole new division for us, you know, as a business. And, you know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of hard stops, but I like this 80-20, you know, I like the 80-20 rule of focusing 80% on what got you here and 20% on where you need to go. And then as that changes over time, I mean, if you look at something like Netflix, you know, Netflix never wanted to people DVDs. They always wanted to stream movies. They just didn't have the money to buy all the rights, nor did anybody have internet service to deliver it yet. But they knew where they wanted to go and they knew what the bridge plan was. The money right now is in projects. If there are still a lot of companies that want to do CapEx projects, we have to have a division that handles that. But we have to be looking hard at the com customers that do want to have operational expenditure for their AV. And people keep saying, you know, this as a service model, are these things that these aren't going to work, that they can't work for people. You know, something we couldn't talk about two days ago when we did a prep call for this was something that just happened yesterday that came out. And Zoom all of a sudden brought out a, a hardware as a service platform. You don't think somebody who's a $9 billion company who brought out a hardware as a service platform, you think they did that on a whim? Or do you think they did that because they know there's pent up customer demand for paying for services on a monthly basis and having the hardware included in that in a way that they don't have to worry about it and manage it? There is a market for this. And as AV, we've been resistant to this. It's been talked about for the last two, three years. And we don't like to do it that way, so we don't build it. Well, if we don't build it, somebody else will. And they have. They're starting to. So our job as AV providers is exactly what Charmaine said. We need to do an audit with our customers. What do you need and how can we be of the most value to you? We had to do this with one of our customers. We have ego as AV. We want to drive. We just do. We want to do the design. We want to do the implementation. We don't want to talk to your consultant because the consultant's outdated and he doesn't know what he's talking about. We do this every day and we want to do it our way, right? This is what we want to do. We want to drive the bus. Sometimes they don't want us to drive. You know, we went to one of our customers and said, hey, look, like, we know you have a technology team. We know you're redoing a whole bunch of your systems over the next two months. How can we best help you? And they said, you know what? We need an extra eight hands on deck. Great. Let's do that. Let's figure out that. And then as we're on site, we develop relationships. They see our expertise. They, they start leaning us on us for advice. And all of a sudden now we have this better relationship, but it started because we were able to just say, hey, how do we provide the most value to you and not come in with this, um, I guess, hard stop mentality of this is the way we do business. And if you don't want to do business like that, then we don't do business with you. And, and I think that's going to be the hardest mental switch for people. Yeah, absolutely. Charmaine, uh, Mark brings up a very important point about the fact that not just Zoom, but others are, are getting into this model where they're, they're, they're providing a service, right? They're going out, they're doing the market analysis and saying these are what our customers are asking for. What steps do integrators need to take? What are those baby steps, those first few things to, to not necessarily guarantee success, right? Because nobody can do that, but to give yourself the, the, the best foot forward and the best foundation for moving to this model. Well, the first baby step is, you know, basically looking at the customers you have now. What do they have? What are they doing? What are they talking about? A lot of times, again, like Mark says, in the AV industry, we start at the project, the design, we do everything, we drive the bus, we want to be fast and furious, right? But we now have to change that and we have to do a different type of approach with the customer where we figure out what they have. Teams and Zoom right now is a predominant thing with most of our customers. So we have to start there. I think that's part of where we start. You know, how do we work with customers that are deploying more team rooms and team scenarios to keep their workforce that are remote going? How do we work to supply them, you know, the service, the cameras, the setups that they need and go deep and wide in your customer? right? Uh, far and wide. I'm not a sports girl, so I don't know the exact term. You guys can tell me if it's far and wide, deep and wide, but to go deeper within your customer account and not just work with the same people you're working with, you know, depending on the organizations that you're working with, there are sub um, subsets of that company. There are divisions that you can go into and speak to that are probably perplexed 
and wondering, okay, where do we go? What do we do? You have to start going in deeper and more viral into the clients and start working with other teams that you're not used to working with before. You know, the non-Navy people, the IT people, security, you know, people that actually need some help that the AV world can help them with. And Teams and Zoom, that's a good part of that conversation. You have to get your people fully trained up on that Teams, Zoom, how it works, how to create a Zoom environment, a Zoom room, a team room, how to set that up, how to customize it for a customer. Uh, those are some of the baby steps that it's right in our reach right now. In addition to that, security. You know, security is also right in our reach right now. Um, there's a lot of companies that are looking, okay, how do we assess people's temperatures when they come into our space? What kind of equipment that we can install and monitor and collect that data? These three things are right in our reach where we could start approaching that with our customers, having those conversations that we normally don't have by going deeper and wider within the client. Yeah, absolutely. And, and deep and wide for my, my, uh, my Pentecostal background and upbringing, that's an old uh, Sunday school song. So um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, Mr. Coxon, what Charmaine is talking about is, is expanding kind of your horizons and looking out beyond what you're, what you're used to and what you're comfortable with necessarily, maybe. But what are other areas that you can take a look at, like taking a look at, at what your customers and, and which customers are spending money with you now, right? Which ones, you know, what are they spending it on and, and who's spending money with you? Yeah, I think that's something that we've had to do internally as a business, right? I mean, they're in California and you said if, if there are 50 states and there are 50 different stages of recovery, right? And some are, are retracting and some are expanding and some were expanding and now are retracting again. You know, it's hard to tell what the rules are. But, um, you know, your best indicator is exactly what you said. You know, who is still engaging with you? Who is still spending money? And where are your technicians now on site? Um, and what are they doing? And then the next level of that is something, you know, I've had to do with my team is like, okay, why are those people still engaging with us? So, you know, if we have customers in healthcare, we have customers in private education, higher ed, you know, what is driving, what is driving their upgrades right now? What is keeping them moving? And then the best thing to do you know, we're talking about deep and wide. The best thing to do is to look across and say, okay, well, if XYZ uh, microbiology really likes working with us right now in the healthcare industry, who are their top three competitors? Because guess what? Those companies are probably facing the same challenges, tackling the same problems and need the same type or value the same type of help that you're giving your customer you could also benefit them as well. So creating these ideal customer profiles of the top three or four companies that you're helping right now in this time of crisis, and then looking across and saying, okay, I think we offer something fairly unique. And I can go to these people and with confidence say, hey, we're helping your peers. And it almost creates this, not, a, not so much a bandwagon effect, but almost some FOMO on, in, in a way, right? Some fear missing out that like, are our competitors embracing a strategy that's going to help them outdo us? And should we be talking to the same company about what we need to do in our organization to drive our initiatives forward? And we found this to be very, very valuable because those lessons, especially if you have niche knowledge in a certain vertical, going in and speaking that customer's language and replaying the problems that you know they're probably having based on their peer having the same problems, all of a sudden you've created this huge, you know, you've created this huge relationship um, that allows you to, that allows you to have uh, an ongoing conversation and drive your business forward. Absolutely. We have some, I think we have some mute. We, we, we have some mute issues, which is always fun in a, in a video conference. So that's fun. Uh, wait a second, wait a second. Somebody, somebody, sent a, somebody sent me a, somebody sent me a sign. Oh, please mute your mic. Yes, there we go. There we go. Like <laughs> um, Charmaine, another, another aspect of that though, is also looking and see who your, who your clients are connected to, right? Not necessarily who their competitors are, but it, do they have a subsidiary, right? Do they have, you know, folks that they have, you know, um, existing business relationships with and where, where you can kind of go down a little bit farther down that tail and say, hey, we already work with your partner here. Let's work with you too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I recently got new business by going, uh, my company, Varix, we're working with a sub and uh, we decided to go with the parent. <laughs> to start talking to the parent and definitely, you know, broker a relationship with them and, and it became very beneficial. 
And so now we're looking at the whole playing field saying, okay, now we have to look at the parent, the divisions going down the line, seeing what they're interested in. And for some of them, there are some things that we can sort of do, but not perfectly. And if we can't do it perfectly, we have partners. So we do believe in courting, you know, other partners that can help us provide that service and get the customer there. Because at the end of the day, the customer is usually going to go with the person that makes their life easier, makes it easier for them to, you know, do or accomplish and achieve a goal that they have in mind. If they can do it through you and you can make it easy for them and you have a partner you want to bring along, even better instead of trying to, okay, we'll bring you along Charmaine and then we'll get this other person from this company and then we'll try to put it together. Customers don't really want to go through that work. They want someone to do the work for them and they don't mind if they have a relationship with you, if you volunteer to help them in that path and say, okay, well, we do have someone in our team that does this, but we also partner with someone that we know does it exceedingly well. Is that fine? Most of the time it's yes. Some club, you know, companies will white glove it, um, but not necessarily. It all depends on, you know, how you want to approach it. You can white glove it, you can partner more, but as I say, more shotgun weddings and courtships in the business world are going to happen. So um, that's, that's, that's basically going to help you get through um, to provide broader band of services and different services beyond what your company is able to do now. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to kind of turn a corner here and, and talk about verticals for a second. And before or as I do that, I'm going to tread on some some sacred ground in the commercial AV space. And I know this, but it's okay. Y'all can, my name is Tim at avnation.tv. You can send, send me eight letters letter, later, later. But three months ago, we, we got thrown together, right? Uh, again, depending on where you are geographically, you were told to, to sit in your house and stay put. And some of you still are. And, you know, there's the stories of, of Google and um and Alphabet, the parent company, as well as Twitter and others that said, here's a thousand dollars, go and make your, your home office, you know, perfect or whatever it is you, you want. And they did, they sent home laptops and things of that nature. And folks had poor lighting or no green screen or this, that, and the other. And there, there was, there was an inconsistent or a horrible experience to, you know, to, to get really negative on it. Mark, I'll start with you on this. Residential has been an area that commercial AV has long eschewed. It's not what we do, right? I, I don't do homes. I do corporate. I do this. I do big stadiums. I do lecture halls. However, in this work from home environment, and depending on who you talk to and who you believe on how many people are really legitimately going to stay working from home, is there not now a place for commercial AV to come in and say, look, let us help you with not only your space, your workspace, but also your home network to help it get there and help it stabilize and give you the best work from home experience possible. There's a hundred percent a reason to be in that market. Um, I'll answer it there up front. I'll say I've, I've worked in both. I started in residential AV in Arizona in 2002, worked through the housing boom in 2009. Uh, moved to California, did museum and specialty AV, then worked on the manufacturer side, and now I've come back to corporate commercial healthcare education, right? So I've run the gamut of these things. There are differences in the type of clients you work with. I will tell you, if you, if you walk someone's house, the emotional reaction to what you do in there is going to be very high because it is their home and it is a representation of themselves. So the, 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 you know, the, uh, some of the resistance or some of the, some of the awareness that you have to have around that is huge. So will there be some new skill sets that maybe you need to develop? Yes. But let me, let me say this is that I think quickly, this is where we have an opportunity when we talk about clients and trust and all of these things and where we can add value. This is where we really have an opportunity to sit down with clients or sit down with companies and say, Hey, look, the, the flip, the switch was flipped on us two months ago. We all were thrown into chaos. And we made it work. We all survived. We went into survival mode. We grabbed tools off the shelf that we knew we could implement quickly and we made it, right? But now we have to have a strategy that moves forward. So how do we help you audit what worked well and what didn't? You know, what were your biggest problems 
in that experiment over those two months? What things really well that surprised you? Like, wow, we were really ready for video at home because we all had Surface Books and we all had Teams already installed and that's what we used and it worked well. What didn't work well? Like, hey, we half the people don't know how to mute their mics or they don't have headsets at home. We hear dogs barking constantly or they're typing on their keyboard or eating lunch, you know? Like, what were those things? And then really help them then boil down, okay, instead of giving somebody a thousand dollars to spend however they want and some person buys a ring light, like I just turned mine off and now all of a sudden, you know, their face is now bright and happy and some other person buys a microphone and has great audio, but their lighting is terrible. Instead of doing something like this, boil down your employees to two or three different groups. Like, Hey, these people are engineers. They work from home at doing design. These people work from home, their sales, they're meeting on different platforms. Look at what that is and then create a standard. Create a standard that you, that help them create a standard that they're sending to these types of employees based on the work they do in their home offices or their work from anywhere environments. And then all of a sudden what you have is you have three or four scenarios that you're supporting as opposed to 15,000 scenarios that you're supporting as a corporate IT entity, right? Because eventually what happens is if everybody's working from home and every meeting is a product productivity from home and that's the only way you're getting work done, guess what? Corporate IT is now shouldering the burden of making sure that everybody's connected well and everything sounds right. That becomes a nightmare if you let everybody buy their own camera off of Amazon, right? So we have this opportunity to do that. I'll tell you the other thing that um, has come up in a lot of my discussions with corporate real estate and different people uh, and the corporate world has been um, just the quality of the home network. You know, there's a company called Access Networks that we all may know who a couple years ago or a few years ago started really looking at like, okay, we do really nice home networks. Do we have a commercial play? And there, there is a large opportunity now for with your kids from home doing Zoom classes, watching Netflix, playing video games, doing Minecraft realms or whatever my kids are doing right now. That's probably going to crash my bandwidth here in about five seconds. So I apologize in advance. Um, should we have, should we have corporate level networks in our homes where we can have dedicated traffic to our office devices and let the, let the rest of the house fend for the remaining bandwidth for their leisure activities. And the answer to that is yes. And so there's a huge place for us to play as integrators to help people help those companies figure out what those standards should be, what those packages can be. And maybe that doesn't mean we're going in the house. Maybe it does. Um, maybe that means we're staging things and we're sending them to corporate IT in boxes and we're creating these kits for them so they don't have to do that. And then they can deploy those kits out easily to their, to their people. Um, maybe that means we have a relationship with a distributor that can drop ship to a hundred different locations. Um, but what Char Charmaine said about back office, there's another place where back office is, is going to become very important depending on the strategy that we pick. But we should definitely 100% be, be thinking about that as a serious strategy because half the desks are not going to be in the office anymore. If your job was to supply half the desks with communication and half the rooms with communication, half of those rooms and desks are somewhere else. Do you want 50% of your market to go away or do you want to follow them to where they went, which is the home? Yeah. So, I mean, Mark brought up actually a really good point. What does it look like as we move into this next stage and half the desks are at somebody's house? What does it look like for AV and IT support for those companies and for your companies? Well, it looks like more of a service. I mean, basically, they're going to need more desktop support, you know, need the ability to call a service desk uh, to get the help for those individual knowledge workers, right? Because they're not in the office anymore. It's not a place where they're going to a room in one specific place to collaborate and, and do conferencing, where if that breaks, I'm dispatching someone to that room or remote accessing into that room. Now it's going to look like, okay, this one person in Arizona needs help. Uh, we can get to them. Can you guys call and work with them? Yes, sure. And that's kind of what's happening now. So a lot of clients are, you know, remotely working. Okay, we got this. We set it up. We don't know how this camera works. How do I get it to work better? Um, oh, this individual uh, next in California wants help. It's going to be more of an individual service assistance 
where you're going to be working with remote offices, more remote workers, people who are working from home. That's really what it's shaping into right now as we speak. I speak with customers that call me today and they say, okay, this one spot, uh, I have someone here, can you speak with them for me? And I say, okay, sure. And I'm just branching out now and I'm becoming more viral speaking to the different individuals and different mini office setups you know, for the purposes of COVID-19 and I'm helping them, which is helping them with their time uh, dedicated to other things that is really, really important. And I'm taking some of the load off of that. So any way that we can find to take the load off of our clients in that way, the decision makers who need that assistance now that everyone's gone remote and there's more, you know, now there's more offices, it's just not in the same building. That's what, that's what it's looking like. That's how uh, we're going to get there. We got to figure out how to be flexible and adaptable in order to support those clients in that way. Well, Mark, that actually brings up a, a really good point. The fact of, of one of the technologies that AV has tried to foster or, or, or shepherd over the last probably five or six years, and that's remote management. Uh, and that is going to be key in this next stage, at least for those that are working from home. And, and since you're deploying it for working from home, you might as well deploy it for the, for the office as well. You know, what sort of skill sets are we looking at when it comes to this? Is this simply just, you know, a, a dashboard or a fail safe, right? Where the fire department, where something breaks, then we can kind of go in and, and remotely, you know, uh, switch the power or, 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 you know, remotely hopefully fix something and then drop ship it if, if it's broken. What does that look like from an AV standpoint and an IT support standpoint for those folks? So, I mean, I think it can vary depending on the scenario, but I mean, I, I like your idea here. I did read it on Commercial Integrated to give credit where credit is due that, you know, some of the baby steps into managed services would be just to offer remote monitoring and management as your starter. You know, that might not be an SLA with an on-site response. It may not even be ours. It may just be giving clients access to seeing and, and changing things from a remote platform that they weren't able to do before. It may be just selling access to that platform to the client and you not even doing it as an integrator. The second stage would be being able to help. And I know I've been talking to, uh, you know, some of the folks that do IP based control. And, you know, there are a lot of things that you can build into the background. If people don't know, Zoom has an API that if you're an enterprise level client, there's an API that you can build into a control system and you can go in and you can, look at whether there's somebody's cameras on or not and turn it on for them if they're having problems and you know readjust which speakers or microphone they're using and all of those things so from an integration perspective number one we need to become experts in the things that we actually that our customers are using right and we need to become experts in something besides the free version you know a lot of us like oh i'm a zoom expert because i know how to change my virtual background yeah okay great that's nice you know sally knows how to change her virtual background too how are we adding value to that process besides just saying, oh, yeah, Zoom, we do that. Um, and it, that really it takes a little bit of an investment on our side. Um, and then looking at how we can build those back-end tools into a larger platform. So you're not having to switch dashboards back and forth and back and forth. It's like, okay, I can see your projectors over here in my Fusion XIO. And then if I go into this little web portal and type in this IP address, I can see some Zoom devices. And then if I go over here and do this, you create too much complexity. People companies especially, if they're going to have remote tools, they'd like you to consolidate them as much as possible so that they can do some of that help desking or so that you can do it yourself. So, you know, I think, you know, I make this point on workplace all the time because we work in workplace. You can't be an expert in work in workplace technology without being an expert in the workplace. How are people working? You know, what are they using and how are they doing it? And what are the big problems? And then once you know that, then you can start to set up your service to go around it. But it, it really takes us digging into the back end of some of these tools and developing relationships with the company besides a resale agreement. You know, um, we found this out really quick with a customer, you know, and it's a, it was a learning opportunity for us. But we found this out really quickly where somebody asked us for something through you know, one of the major Kodak manufacturers and the reseller told us, you know, everything worked just fine, but we didn't have a core subject matter expert from that manufacturer involved in the design process. And then later we found out that, you know, we actually needed to be in a different product and a different service to help the customer. And that was a fumble, you know, that's a fumble and it doesn't make us look good. We figured it out and we, we worked it out with the manufacturer, but taking the time up front, if you're going to develop this as a core part of your business, you might make a phone call to somebody besides the sales 
salesperson at that company and really start to dig into what makes that product tick and how you can best support it over time. And people that do that strategy will be able to help people anywhere, which is nice, which is part of what this is. So, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Charmaine, as we kind of wrap up here, let's take a look at the verticals that are going to explode coming out of this. And some of us can already, you know, take them off all the top off the top of our head but from where you sit you know either geographically but also you know spending a number of years in the IT field before you came over to AV what do you look at when and, and what do you see you know the second half of this year and going into 2021 which verticals are you looking at oh definitely looking at healthcare and farmers uh, healthcare farmers especially now in the time of covid a lot of the healthcare institutions that we work with, they also have schools. So a lot of those schools got the stimulus uh, money uh, to help with advancing their technologies in order to do distance learning and do education and do telemedicine. So that's a big one to look out for. Higher ed is another one that's also gotten some, you know, pretty much a lot of the sectors that got some stimulus are good to look at higher ed, healthcare, Pharmas are very great to look at at this point because they are working overtime to really study this virus and some other things um, that are critical in our health to you know come up with a solution. So they're looking for more effective, efficient ways uh, to really collaborate as a team remotely together to do trainings, you know, in multi-purpose rooms, so on and so forth. Broadcast, uh, broadcast. As companies, absolutely. Uh, companies definitely, definitely take a look at them. They're also doing some interesting things. Those are the verticals right now that just haven't stopped. The financial organizations are still going as well. Um, they're shifting though to not necessarily the traditional AV rooms that we've um, implemented for them. They're still doing those, um, but they're doing other things and they're trying to do more creative and unique things for their clientele, internal clientele. So definitely those sectors are, are the ones to start, you know, talking to, um, playing with, uh, working with more. And also um, there's always been an expression, a former manager of mine and IT used to make, he said, sales is everybody's responsibility. Uh, meaning that as a company, don't leave it just up to your sales, your engineering team. Make this part of the executive's mission with some of your clients to go in and have these conversations. The clients that you have are going to think that's very important. It's going to help them understand the vision of what your company is trying to do and know that you have the buy-in from the executive level in order to do and go there where the client needs you to go. And, and that's important. So it's not just having the salesperson stand as the lonely grunt guy by themselves in front of the client. You're going to have to incorporate a team of people, including the executive level of your company, to be part of these meetings. And that should start immediately. Um, and it shouldn't, you shouldn't hesitate. This is the time to really imp implement them into your meetings with your clients immediately, quickly. All right. Very good. Mark, same question is, is what verticals are you looking at? You know, the ones that have moved well for us that didn't seem to skip a beat, um, obviously healthcare. Um, there's a lot of need for healthcare right now, unfortunately. Um, and these, these institutions can't slow down and they're looking at um, all sorts of tools for, you know, using technology to either, you know, distance people or queue people or provide virtual, you know, consultations and all of these things to protect, you know, their, their in-house patients as well, right? So uh, I think there's a huge opportunity for that. Um, we've seen our, our higher education folks being going crazy, obviously, um, making sure that their classrooms are, are ready for this high flex environment where they have in-person and remote students because a lot of universities had started with that, but some hadn't. So lecture capture and cameras and all of those things. Um, Charmaine mentioned broadcast, and I see some chat going on in broadcast in the chat there too. One of the things I'd like to say is that like, what I did a couple years ago going to NAB um, as a, as a I guess, exhibitor at, a, at NAB, we went, when I worked for a company called Vadio, and Vadio makes, you know, not what most people would think of as TV cameras or broadcast cameras, but what I quickly found out that year, and this was about four years ago, was that almost everybody's in the broadcast business now. So if you're streaming, technically you're in the broadcast business, right? And so there are levels of 
that. Obviously, a TV station and sprinters is going to be one level of that. Another level of that is going to be a professor in a classroom, which really at this point, if you're streaming a class, you are in the broadcast business. Um, or if you're streaming a, a church service for house of worship, you're in the broadcast business. Almost every, if you're podcasting from your home office, you may be in the, this is a Jeff Foxworthy bit waiting to be written right now. You just may be in the broadcast business. Um, hey, say it louder for those in the back there, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, this is a, this is something to really take seriously. And, you know, when we were there, it was interesting because there were a lot of even traditional broadcast type companies like you know, people that run channels that you pay for on cable, they were saying, we have a talking head show and I no longer want three cameramen in the room. I just need three really high definition PTZ cameras with a camera controller and some presets. And I can have one person do what four people were doing in this room with a director and three cameramen. And all of a sudden I can still do that talking head show in a way that I can do that really quickly and easily with these off the shelf type PTZ products that we didn't have before now that everything's in high definition. So you should really start, I mean, if you're a company that hasn't looked into, um, you know, broadcast level equipment, like looking at camera controllers and PTZ cameras and presets and NDI gear and, um, you know, all this kind of stuff that's out there, this is this could be a very good time for you to up your skill set in that broadcast world. And it doesn't mean you're going to go build a TV station or a truck outside of, you know, 49er Stadium. It may mean that you're going to go build out a studio at your corporate, at your high-end customer's office because they're podcasting they're doing training videos for their customers everybody's moving their content to online they're becoming producers of their own content and so it's a huge vertical that we should be looking at in all sorts of levels really quickly a couple things um i'm a, a fan of, of defining definitions and acronyms ndi uh software developed by new tech it allows you to take your camera and put it on the network right fantastic um fantastic uh, solution there the other thing is, is something that Mark said, and, and that's talking about, you know, uh, giving you the opportunity to uh, PTZ, pan, tilt, zoom, a, a camera. If your work environment is to the point where you don't want anybody there, right, or you, you want to safely, safe, uh, safe distance, social distance, giving folks the opportunity to, uh, the opportunity to remotely control those cameras outside of their, outside of the, the building even. You can t tie in, get in on the network, and you can control uh, those cameras, right? You can have your technical director or your director control those, have the talent sitting in front of the camera, have two or three cameras, you know, um, surrounding them. They can switch them. They can select the, the camera shot as well. And then you know, it goes to some sort of other you know, software or out to Zoom or out to Google or whatever. So that's a fantastic, fantastic point, the fact that we can do this safely distance but still produce some, some high-quality stuff. Um, Charmaine, uh, last question here, and this will be for both of you, and then we'll take some, some questions and answers. Um, as we come out of this crisis, and let's say that we all get to, to phase five. Here in Illinois, we're, we're phase, we're, we have five phases. We're, we pretty much follow California, um, except we're not going backwards. Sorry, Mark. Um, <laughs> but uh, as we get to phase five, right, and, and, and everybody is, is, is finally going back to work, what is the one or two things as an integrator they have to have to do uh, as soon as everybody gets back to full strength? Uh, that the integrator has to do? Yes. In, before, well, the integrator basically, it's more of they have to, one thing they really, really, really have to do is focus on the strategy of how to engage again with the client, but virtually. They're still, even when, the phase five, seven, or whatever, six, 10, whatever state you're in is over. A lot of these clients aren't going back to work until 2021 and maybe in, you know, in perpetuity never. And they're going to cut back the spaces uh, in a physical brick and mortar. So you have to be able to know how your team has to know how to work through these tools, how to work with Zoom, how to teach your customers to do the same, how to work. Basically, your team has to be prepared to do these type of meetings. They have to be prepared to make presentations better, how to run productive meetings. Um, the back office situation, again, is going to be key. Payments, if you're not a company that's into monthly billing, start. If you're not a company that takes credit card or whatever, effectively, you know, making the service easier for your clients to pay for 
look into it. You've got to be prepared to be able to do transactional business more efficiently uh, with your customers. You've got to be prepared for that because it's not, you know, after everyone goes back in, there's still a lot more work that's going to be done. We have an election coming up. We don't know what our government's going to look like. That's going to change things. The market, you know, whatever COVID-19 is going to do in other areas where it's spiking, there's still a great deal of unpredictability. So that, that transactional uh, flexibility and agility has to be there. You have to be there as a company to be prepared in order to keep sustaining that for maybe, I guess, a year or two. That's going to be very key. And again, it's going to take the executive buy-in. It's everyone coming together within the organization to assess the things we need to do based on what our customer and our market wants. And if you're not listening and talking to your customers, like Mark said this plenty of times, talk to them, ask them questions. You don't have to have a meeting just because you're having a transaction with a customer. That's the other mistake we make. Have a meeting because you want their information. You want mind share with your customer, do that more. You have to prepare that way. Otherwise, you're gonna be in the dark. And as Mark said before, someone else is gonna come before you and do something that you didn't think of because you didn't have those conversations. Yeah, a year or two, good Lord, all right. Uh, Mr. Coxon, uh, last word on this before we say take, take, take some Q and A's. Uh, what are one or two things that the integrator has to do as we all come out of this last phase? Um, I, I agree with something Charmaine said, and I've seen it in the chat here too. I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to become experts in using these virtual tools ourselves. And we need to have something besides us sharing our PowerPoint screen and doing a Zoom call that customers already know how to do. Because what's gonna happen is we're gonna have sales calls and we're gonna have a lot of interactions, especially before onsite, um, that happen before now. You know, people, if we do have to have onsite meetings, they're gonna be less, right? Um, they're gonna do a lot of this exploration here and I'm a big fan of, you want people talking about the meeting, even if they're not talking about the content. And I say this about placemaking and everything else too, right? Somebody should get off the phone with you and go, or stop you partway through your presentation and go, how are you guys doing that? Like, hey, I know what you're showing me, but how are you doing what you're doing right now? Because we have meetings and like everybody goes to sleep. We just went through this whole meeting. It was very engaging. You guys were using this weird stuff and graphics were floating up and you're sitting here talking and you've got news anchor pictures of what you're talking about with preset bullet points and they're not overlapping your face. And how, how are you making that happen? Like somebody should stop you and actually ask you how you're facilitating the meeting so well. Because if people come out of that and they say, wow, we just went through this meeting and these guys were awesome. That's the kind of meetings we want to have with our customers. Then all of a sudden, now you have a customer because you proved that you know how to communicate virtually in a world where they're struggling to communicate virtually, right? And we've, we've already seen this happen. We built, a, we built a system for a customer where we did something like this. It was a combination of broadcast and VTC. And all of a sudden, three companies that they work with that had meetings with them through the system are now engaging us to talk about how we designed something similar for them. Absolutely. So, you know, having that experience of that meeting, somebody should stop you in the meetings and just say, what are you doing? You know, I mentioned in the comments, Prezi. Prezi has a live tool where you can actually build all your graphics over live video as a backdrop. So you're sitting there talking and all your bullet points are just coming up. You're not looking at two screens and going back between content and a talking head, content and a talking head, and reading things ahead of time while the guy's talking and missing what they said. You're going through this presentation together. So I think becoming an expert in these tools and actually using them as a business. AV, we're terrible at using our own tools. Right, like so many of us had to go out and buy stuff to get virtual to work in our own offices. We're integrators. Everything should have had remote access before. Um, I would say the other thing is, uh, finally learn, finally learn some networking skill. Like even if you're not going to distribute video over IP or audio over IP, or you're not doing that now, guess what? All of a sudden, again, half the desks went somewhere else. Half the desks are no longer in the office. You're going to be having to distribute content through the cloud to somebody else somewhere else. And if you don't know a little bit about networking and firewalling and multicast and all these things that companies may start to ask you about, because now it matters to them because they are now in the broadcast business, um, then you, you, have to, you have to be able to speak that language and help them. So I would invest in those two things. All right, very good. That'll be where we end our presentation and our, our chat. Thank you both so much. Um, Paul, we'll bring you back in here and, and or you want me to, to facilitate some of the questions. Well, one thing I wanted to, was waiting to jump in with 
was that I did just hear back from Andrew Cross, who is the creator of NDI, and he is going to be presenting at the Presence Summit. Um, so Excellent. New Tech has agreed to be part of it. And they're actually going to be giving away some of their NDI gear as part of the giveaway. It's going to be interesting. But uh, it is something that I, you know, I think that for us, I'll say as PTZ Optics, our cameras, uh, we've integrated NDI into it. And we've, been ha we've had NDI for three or four years. And it just every year becomes a larger and larger percentage of our business. And with Huddlecam, we introduced the fir world's first NDI webcam. And so like, it does surprise me, integrators aren't sure what NDI is. And for me, you know, coming from the broadcast world, the streaming world, it's like so crucial. And I've been going to NAB every year for six years and it's been out for a very long time now. So for us, it was like, oh, an NDI webcam? That makes so much sense. Um, and it's actually the only one available today. Uh, but like NDI PTZ cameras and, and things like that um, is, is really, ex we're seeing it explode and there's good reason for it. So I wanted to reinforce, you know, that thought, Mark. Um, there are some great questions in the chat we could answer. Um, they've been coming well, through. Before you do that, I, I also want to point out the fact that the NDI is not new tech specific. There are a number of manufacturers, switcher manufacturers, and software manufacturers who are using the technology and bringing it into a virtual environment uh, that will let you use the software and bring in NDI as a stream and then use a virtual switcher, if you will, uh, and and present the NDI image, you know, regardless of where it is. There are a couple of also uh, digital signage manufacturers, digital signage content creators that are using those NDI streams to incorporate into some pretty dynamic uh, imaging. It's so easy to use. Uh, the big, the first big, you know, wave of it was when OBS, Open Broadcaster Software, was built for it. That was that gave forty million people access to it. Then Skype brought it in that was 300 million people and it is the number one requested feature in zoom if you follow the developer forums now that zoom's done their 90 day security uh, overall I, I mean i think we need to be ready for a massive push uh with ndi in a, a couple things i i can't say you know that zoom's definitely gonna do it but uh you know there's definitely some huge announcements coming up We'll see. Maybe next week, Andrew Cross will give us some announcements as well. But I've seen it. You know, when it went to OBS, 40 million new customers, you know, asking about, hey, can I use your NDI camera this way and that way? And they just keep announcing these big integrations. And again, to Mark's point, you know, it's more than just, you know, sometimes there is with Zoom rooms, like they're great. Zoom is now offering hardware as a service. I do think we need to pivot to more broadcast, streaming, higher value add studios uh, which you know could be implemented in all of our core customers. Uh, you know, hardware as a service from Zoom. Just think about it: hundred bucks a month directly from Zoom. Every conference room in your country. In your this was coming. I, I don't think it's like a doomsday for AV integrators. I think that there are definitely uh, channel partner opportunities in AV as a service. But you know, it is you know kind of changing a lot and. We've seen a pivot to streaming and studios being very successful. House of Worship, oh my goodness, incredible right now. Um, you know, distance learning capture solutions. Um, so anyway, let's get to some of the questions. I do think just that NDI thing just, just warranted a little bit more excitement because there's a lot there. Um, Absolutely. We're kind of going, there's a ton here, but I, you know, we've already gone over an hour, so I don't think we really have to, I think we can, we, we can, we can save some of these questions for next week, Tim. What do you okay. think? No, that's fine with me. Yeah, absolutely. Did you want to get to any of these, Bill, that were in the, in the chat room specifically? I think we're good. Okay. We, I think uh, we t kind of touched on some of them inside chat. So that was my feeling too. So I just wanted to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I really, truly do believe that this is something that not only can we help, I think this was helpful N next Wednesday, I think is going to be even more helpful. And uh, I think that we're going to transform the way that many of our channel partners do business and more importantly, our customers, right? And we're going to get to those higher levels of services, engagements, transformations, and we're going to hear from, you know, the guy who wrote the book on this stuff. So pick one of these up if you can. And, uh, I'll see you guys next week. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Bye.